Shout out to today's guest, ESPN's Trevor Maddich and Utah head coach, former Cougar, Kyle Whittingham. Shows on demand via the podcast and the BYU TV and BYU radio apps. Let's whip it. It's time for the Cougar Whip Around. Cougars in the NFL. Other Cougars that we haven't mentioned already in the NFL over the weekend. Fred Warner had two tackles in the Niners 27-17 win over Kansas City. Daniel Sorensen in that game led the Chiefs with six tackles and a pass breakup. And in the Chargers lost to my Seahawks. Michael Davis had two tackles. Soccer. Ashley Hatch scores the game-winning goal in the Washington Spirits 2-1 to win Spirit. over the Orlando Pride on Saturday. Today's rise and shout-outs. For me, Jerem goes to the gold medal-winning USA women's volleyball team at the Norseka Champions Cup. Helped out by former Cougar Ronnie Jones Perry. She had 11 kills and a four-set win over the Dominican Republic. Nicely done, Ronnie. Copper Hills, let's go. And mine goes to Andrew Bangeter or intern Andrew as Gregor Bell calls him at college game day he held up uh, y flags magic happens which by the way is the new parade name apparently over the weekend yep. they came out and said that so the austin collie phrase turned parade nice job andrew repping the y in orlando during espn's college game day our question of the day which one factor gives you the most confidence that byu will beat utah on thursday our elite voice of the day presented by sundance mountain resort and on twitter at it's a faux hammer the overall progress of the offense, grimy 2.0 behind this offensive line and Wilson's swag, also talent, will be the difference. I believe this year BYU has the offense to complement the defense. Okay, let's Hashtag go. beat Utah. Sorry to Dennis Pitta, ran out of time. Conversation continues 24-7 on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook. Use the hashtag BYUSN. For Jerem. I am Spencer. Shout out to Andrew George. And stay tuned for the season debut of Coordinator's Corner with Greg Rebell. It's next. Online BYU Sports Nation is out for now. Whether it's for you or for them. For you or for them. For you, or for them, you can find it here. are going to battle it out in fun and intense games for a chance to win $10,000. This is Battle of the Ages. So I hear you've got a new show. I'm on a new show called Making Good. I go around the country and I find people that are making a difference in their community. Mm. It's the best thing I've ever been a part of. You can tell you're having a lot of fun. It is so much fun. Um, what's hey, wake up. The boom's in the shot. Hello? Let me check. Is there a Kirby here? You're watching BYU TV on KBYU DT Provo Salt Lake City. For the first time in 2019 and from our brand new home inside Studio C at the BYU Broadcasting Building, welcome to the Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. On today's season premiere, it's a coaching triple play as all three BYU football coordinators join me, beginning with special teams coordinator Ed Lamb, followed by defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki and offensive coordinator Jeff Grimes. And as always, we invite you fans, BYU fans, to be a part of the show by submitting questions for the coaches via Twitter using hashtag CCBYU. And with that, we welcome in BYU's special teams coordinator, linebackers coach, and assistant head coach Ed Lamb. Hello again, Ed. How's it going? It's going well. 
Good. And here we go again. Here we go again. Well, uh, today's show has us only three days uh, from the season opener. And for the first time in both programs' history, BYU and Utah open the season against one another. I think of the other sports, the other major sports, everyone's got some kind of exhibition season to get them kind of, you know, tuned up. College football gets right into it. And no better way to get fully immersed, I guess, than with the Utes. That's right. Yeah, it's been so nice to be able to focus on, on that rivalry throughout the whole offseason. Generally, coaches are kind of running around housekeeping in the offseason, making sure that our guys are focused on the first game and, and then the second game, the second game, and, and so on. And, and this has been a really nice opportunity to really focus on a game that we know the players want. We know there's a sour taste in their mouth from a year ago, the way they finished. You know, winning and losing, I think a lot of times people are, are really hung up on that right now. But it, in, in this case, it's about we didn't play how we wanted to play down the stretch. We'll get more into the Utah game coming up in a bit. But uh, let's catch up first with uh, what the Cougars have been up to over the last month. You've been up through uh, your fair share of training camps in your career. Uh, was this one any different from any others from, say, your BYU years? Oh, that's, that's a really good question. The way you started that question, I was going to say this has been so much different. But... but much more like when I was a player here with, with Coach Edwards. Um, Kalani's really made a concerted effort to, to bring the players into the leadership roles. And we actually had one whole practice where the players ran scripted, uh, designed, ran the whole practice themselves. What was and, the genesis of that, by the way? Uh, genesis was you know, going back to, uh, to the spring. We wanted to give the players a lot more leadership opportunities so that they would carry through the summer with player-run practices. And then uh, Kalani's done a lot of research on on uh, educational techniques, learning techniques, and, and peer, the power of peer-to-peer -peer learning. And obviously there's leadership potential uh, opportunities in there. And, uh, you know, I, I just happened that Kalani and I were standing together during that player practice. And uh, it, was, it was one of the most vocal, intense practices we've had. I said, it reminds me a lot of uh, Coach Edwards' practices where as players, we really felt like we had to bring the energy. You know, we had a lot of coaches that had been around a long time. We knew they knew the game inside and out. We knew that they were fantastic coaches, but they didn't run around bringing energy to practice. That was our job. Hmm. When you finished it and looked back on it, how impressed were you by the group, really? I, I, yeah, I still am. It's not just that practice, but um, you know, Kalani actually made a, a really good point to the players at the end of the practice. He said, why does this need to be different from any other day? Hmm. Now that the coaches are liberated to step back in tomorrow and, and provide more leadership and, and more energy, why, does, why do the players in any way need to take a back seat to that? And I think the message was, was delivered and, and communicated and heard. Everyone's potential was kind of realized that day in a way. I think so. Yeah, yeah guys realize that th this is not about coaches or captains or seniors. It's about every single guy on the team uh, running, running the show. So you wear a few different hats and have oversight over various areas of the team. Uh, but if you had to drill down on, on your coordinator responsibility, special teams, if there was a camp MVP or a player who stood out for you in special teams uh, this past month, who would it have been? Jake Oldroyd was really the, the surprise of, of camp of, for his punting ability. He um, he is, is really has the potential to help help us flip the field um, when we need to punt from our own end. Um, that's that's been fantastic. The competition between he and and Skyler for the place kicking, and then the competition between he and Danny Jones for the punting is just it's it risen the level of play for all of our specialists. I know that our players feel really good about uh, those guys and, and protecting and covering for all those specialists. And I think. I think uh, out of the three, you know, just Jake's been the biggest surprise. So a bit more about that battle. You knew coming into the year you had a punter, Jones, back. You had a place kicker, uh, Southam, back. But then Jake comes back off the mission. We knew him as a place kicker for a few games a few a couple of years ago. But all of a sudden he becomes a guy that can do them both and do them at a really high level. And then you watch Jake and Skyler throughout camp kind of go back and forth on this thing, right? Yeah, kind of, kind of strange the way it's all taken shape. You know, Jake was more of a punter in high school and then showed up and had kicking ability and and ended up being the, you know, the second team guy until the very last play of the very first game. And uh, that's when he first stepped in, and, and you know the story there. But, um, yeah, for him to, to go then on his mission, heal up his body, come back in a completely different shape, he's, he looks fantastic. He's got a lot of power in everything that he does. He's, he's really made our team a lot better. I don't want to raise expectations too high, but he's been consistently long in his punting uh, throughout camp, right? Yeah, he's hit some monsters, and, and commensurate, uh, hang time always commensurate with distance, too. You know, if he kicks a 60-yarder, it's, it's five-plus seconds of hang time, and, and uh, some, of, some of his punts have really been you know, out of this world so far, and it, it, we haven't had a single punt in a game yet, so 
there's a lot to be said for what happens this Thursday. Mm. Uh, Danny Jones is still in the mix, right, as a punter? D Danny Jones is doing a fantastic job. He's really developed himself well. He always offers us that opportunity to take off running, and we really love that about his style of play. And, and he's our most accurate punter right now, so pinning opponents inside the 20-yard line, he's done a tremendous job of that. Uh, Skyler is uh, still going to be used. How do you plan to, to uh, implement him? Yeah, Skyler's still very much in the in the place kicking battle for uh, PAT field goal and uh, and also kickoffs, and so we'll just let those guys continue to compete at at, at you know we, middle linebacker. We have competition every day at safe, strong safety and every other position on the field. There's competition every day, and really want to to keep that going. It's it's a tremendous value we have right now to have two what I feel like are winning punters and two what I feel like are, are winning place kickers, and we'll let them continue to compete every day. In the return game, it looks like you're leaning on the wide receiver room right now a little bit. We are, yep. Really like uh, Aleva Hifo and what he brings to the to punt return. Um, he does a great job of getting underneath the ball. If he tracks it basically in the first half before the ball reaches its, its zenith, he, he has a pretty good bead on, on where it's going to come down at. So, um, But uh, Dax Milne and Gunnar Romney are also right behind him. Will Watanabe has been a surprise there, too. He's, I think he offers us something in that part of the game. We'll Defensive have those back. four guys. Defensive back, yeah. yeah. Strong safety, walk on for us, and, and really proven his worth on defense and special teams. And then uh, at the at the kickoff return position, Gunner and, and Dax and uh, Tyler Algier, um, those those guys have been doing the majority of, of kick returns. Okay, your other uh, positional area of responsibility comes in the linebacking core. You knew coming into this year, you had a couple guys you could really count on as incumbents, if you will, outside in, in Zane Anderson and Isaiah Kofusi. Uh, middle was going to be a question you had to answer during camp, and how, how did it get answered for you? I think really well. We have, uh, you know, because the question was phrased, how did it work out in camp, then that's the only thing I can judge by. I'm really excited for Thursday to see the guys play. I have tremendous confidence in, in what they'll do, but I feel like that, that uh, you know, whether it's Keenan Pilly, Jackson, uh, Kalfusi, Peyton Wilgar, Kavika Fonua, all those guys are really winning players, and we actually have uh, some defensive packages where, where two and three of those guys will be on the field at the same time. Nice to have the outside experience, though, with guys you can count on and you've seen a lot of. They really raise the level of, of detail for the whole room. You know, in, in football, sometimes we refer to it not as our position group, but our room because we're so often in one classroom. We've got a linebacker room. And the way that Isaiah and uh, Zane prepare and then how coachable they are, the conversations that we can have back and forth, um, I think all of the younger guys in the room have been able to benefit from that. Excellent. All right, it is break time on the show, and as we head to break, this reminder, tomorrow night uh, you can catch the first episode of BYU Football with Kalani Sitake. Watch it Tuesdays at 8.30 p.m. Eastern, 5.30 p.m. Pacific on the BYU TV app, or then see it live at, or then see it the next day, Wednesday, at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific on BYU TV. Coming up next, a look ahead to uh, week one in the rivalry game with Utah, and your questions for special teams coordinator Ed Lamb on Twitter using hashtag CCBYU. You're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Before I was a coach at BYU or before I was even a player, I was a BYU fan. That's why BYU football exists, is because of the fans. To have a bunch of fans that want to see you be aggressive, I think everybody can live through our 123 guys on the roster and the 11 that are on the field at a time. Really, it all starts and ends with the fans. So I hear you've got a new show. I'm on a new show called Making Good. I go around the country and I find people that are making a difference in their community. Mm. It's the best thing I've ever been a part of. You can tell you're having a lot of fun. It is so much fun. Um, what's... Hey, wake up! The boom's in the shot! Hello? Let me check. Is there a Kirby here?
The snap is low. The kick is on its way and makes it through for three. And the Cougars are back in front. Skyler Southam from 45. Well, that was last season in Madison. Uh, BYU picking up a huge road win over a top 10 team. And kudos to Gavin Fowler for that hold, as you saw on the replay. This year, BYU opens the season with a home game against the top 15 team. It's a BYU and Utah. The Utes on an eight-game win streak over their rivals. Most recently, a comeback from down 20 to nothing and 27 to 7 to defeat BYU 35-27 last November in Salt Lake City. Visiting with special teams coordinator Ed Lamb. And Coach Lamb, uh, what, if any, is the residual impact of a game that was played more than nine months ago? Well, I, I think the residual impact is just the we've continued to harken back to the lessons learned. In fact, um, one, of, one of the things that uh, we've been doing as a team during training camp is that we begin each team meeting with a player. Uh, one player will get up and talk about the, their, their home life and, and how they got to BYU and things that are important to them, any hardships they may have had, and, and then also anything that they might have learned if they played in the Utah game. Hmm. And so the, the, you know, like, there's obviously some c consistent themes uh, that go through there with, with finishing and executing it, but also uh, being ready, depth, being ready um, for, for a big moment. and Because um, it was so tested it, last November, that our, depth. Our depth was really yeah. tested in that game, and, and so, was, um, so was Utah's, really, you know, and, and maybe ours was a little more of ours was in-game, and so that, you know, that type of depth is something that players really have to prepare themselves for. Um, it's, it's, you know, it's from a, from a, standpoint of being ready all week and preparing all week to play for an injured player, that's a lot different than coming off the bench for an injured player. Mm. Uh, BYU's last win in this series uh, came 10 years ago, uh, so, so it's been a decade of dominance, you might say, for one side, but the games are rarely one-sided. Uh, it's actually among the most consistently competitive rivalries in uh, all of college football. Of BYU's last eight losses to Utah, only one decided by more than one score, and that's evidence enough, right? Yes, I, well, I think so. Um, I think that the the streak, the the losing streak, is, you know, I, I don't think it can be just um, excused for happenstance or bad luck. I think it's it's there for a reason. I, I think there was a time when BYU was the program that had the upper hand, and and games were close, but BYU would consistently win. And I think there were there was a time when Utah really aspired to be uh, like BYU or to overtake BYU. And now that, you know, the shoe's on the other foot and there's power in that and we embrace that and we respect the heck out of Utah, but we fully expect to compete well and come out on top. Uh, where's BYU perhaps uh, better equipped this year than it even, even was late last year in this game? Um, well, that, gosh, that's always a good question because, you know, there's, um, th th there's certainly areas where some of our players are older, better, healthier, available, whatever. There's other players that we're, we're going to miss, you know, with the players that played in, in, in the Utah game last year and in the bowl game that are no longer with us, seniors. And, and so I think, uh, you know, probably just with a general broad brush, I would say any player that's returning that appeared in that game last year is hopefully for us going to be a little better and a little more prepared. Conversely, uh, where might you expect, if anywhere, Utah to look different or, or more improved personnel-wise? You've got to look at some obvious ones in their backfield, right? Yeah, I think that for them, they've got two of their players that weren't available, uh, you know, offensively in their offensive backfield with the quarterback and running back. And, and uh, those two guys are, are dynamic and capable and, and uh, explosive players. So it'll be a real test for our guys. And that's really, I, I think that's really what both teams are hoping for. I don't think Utah has had as much success as they've had without, uh, you know, wanting every opponent's best shot. And our guys are the same. We really want, we really want their best shot. And be prepared for anything else that might happen. Uh, from social media now, uh, hashtag CCBYU on Twitter. Uh, from Spencer Lindemann for Coach Lamb, uh, what is Jake Oldroyd's field goal range? Oh, he's, hit, uh, he's hit some from um, the low 50. We don't really practice a, a whole lot outside of 50 with a team unit and a, and a heavy rush. Outside of 55, I would say we don't, we don't practice that very often. Of course, the, the, the guys practice it. Jake practices it. Skyler practices it. You know, they can certainly hit 60, 60, maybe to even to 65. But uh, when we talk about range, it's kind of like, well, what's much? People always say that in, in football, and it's like, how far can you hit from? Well, I can hit a full court shot in basketball given enough shots, right? And that might be a 1,000. I don't know. But, <laughs> but uh, 
So, so yeah, I, I think where we would feel most comfortable is to, this year. I think, I think with Jake, when we when we um, get around a 50-yard field goal, I think his percentages go higher and higher. And, and the high 40s are definitely, I feel like, a 80 to 80 percent uh, field goal range. And Utah's been a team uh, that that's managed to use the kicking game as a pretty good offensive weapon for some time now. Uh, whether in this game or others, it's been a big part of uh, how they attack. Uh, they have. They've been fantastic at the kicker and punter position. And Again, um, uh, uh, another aspect of their program that we aspire to be like. And uh, certainly I think we have the ability to do that this year. More social media from uh, Brian Glazier, and this is for Coach Lamb. And he asks, so what do analytics say about onside kicks after 15-yard penalties against the opposition that give you a short field on the kickoff? If, how do you feel about, he says, turning it over possibly on the opponent, say 35-37, as opposed to giving a shot at, a, at an onside? From midfield, yeah, I think the the answer was stated in the question. Uh, after a, after a 15 yard penalty, and an onside kick can be a really good uh, weapon. I think it's it's really all about game uh, situation and and onside kick or not. You know, no matter where the f the field position is, they're not highly successful in college football. A little more at the at the high school level, their onside kicks are are more successful. And so it's just a matter of risk reward for that moment. Are we winning? Are we behind? Do we need it? Uh, do we want to sacrifice potentially 15 yards of field position for, you know, for that? And, uh, yeah, the, uh, the answer in that situation can often be yes. Okay. I, I haven't asked this. I'm sure you've heard it a lot during camp, though, about uh, where this game falls in the schedule, first, last, middle preferences. Uh, you play them when they're scheduled. Uh, but just a kind of a gut reaction to having this be the way you start the season on Thursday. It, it's a fantastic opportunity. It's, I think it's um, led to a tremendous um, off season, summer of preparation, of focus for the players, of motivation, and uh, you know I've I've told any player that will listen, and then the team when I've had the ch chance to speak to them, is that it's fantastic to put all of this energy and motivation into the first game, but but win or lose, there will be a game too, and so I hope that uh, I hope that we can pour out every bit of energy that we have on the field, and then uh, you know maybe maybe take Thursday night to enjoy a victory is our hope and then on on friday morning get up and start preparing for tennessee that would be great coach lamb good to see you again always a learn a lot from you and uh, we'll do it again soon thank you greg all right that is coach ed lamb all right folks a dinner after the game at uh, jcw's includes something for everybody from burgers to wings shakes to salads jcw's quality and a lot of it in lehigh american fork provo south jordan and coming soon to harriman byu versus utah is live on byu radio this thursday Tune in two hours before kickoff for Cougar pregame live, originating from the new tailgate and festivities area now known as Cougar Canyon. That's Thursday, starting at 8.15 p.m. Eastern Time, 5.15 p.m. Pacific. Coming up after the break, defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki joins me as he begins his fourth season on the BYU staff. You're in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. are going to battle it out in fun and intense games for a chance to win $10,000. This is Battle of the Ages. The Fixers, we're, we're a tight-knit group. My whole team is very diversified. It's crazy how well we mesh together. These guys are my family now. You know, they're my brothers and sisters, and, uh, you know, Kieran's like my granddad. <laughs> All of us work as a fine, tight, well-oiled machine, and we work as one unit. Any excuse where I can use my two hands to build something, it, it, that's a good day. I don't know. There's something satisfying about just being able to use a power saw. I've always had a passion for building since I was born. I don't know if SWAT team is the right word for us. I really think it's uh, superheroes. 
I want people to know it's all real. This has changed my life. We are helping thousands of people. It's the hardest I've ever worked in my life, and I couldn't be happier. Coordinator's Corner brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. Time to get defensive on our season premiere as we welcome in for the first time this season defensive coordinator and defensive line coach Elisa Tuiaki. Coach E, good to see you once again. Good to be back. Thank you. And here we go again, just uh, three days out of the season opener. Well, through three seasons at BYU, your defenses have been uh, a really a strong suit for the Cougs. Some great national rankings every season, some NFL draft picks, of course. Uh, what do you think is in store uh, for season four? Um, a lot of the same thing. Really, it's just a big, big tribute to the players. We've got a lot of players that are that are coming back from last season. We didn't lose very many uh, of the guys that have a lot of experience, except for except for you know Sean Taktaki and and uh, Corb and some of those other guys that are making a name for themselves right now in the league. But we've got a lot of uh, good youth and just. A uh, lot, lot of players that have experience coming back. A quick tangent uh, to the NFL. Uh, the Saints played the Jets the other night in the preseason. There was that great pick posted after the game. Taysom Hill, Harvey Longy, Corbin Kofusi, uh, Bronson Kofusi yeah. together. We see that a lot now. These ex Cougs still get together after games. There's yeah. enough of them out there, too. Yeah, no, and that's, that's a cool, tight brotherhood just between all those guys, and it's fun to see. We talked with uh, Coach Lamb about this a little earlier, uh, and that's trying to fill that gap created by Shune Takitaki at middle linebacker. How do you feel you've done at the mic position, especially during camp, at uh, looking at different guys and, and trying to get something sorted out there? I think the players have done a really good job, um, you know, competing within the, within their position groups. But Coach Lamb's done a good job <clears throat> just with their development, with uh, kind of getting kids reps and, and getting the right guys in there and the right combinations and kind of moving them around throughout camp where we feel pretty comfortable right now with where we're at. And comfortable with more than a couple of guys, right? There's a few guys you've got that you think can, uh, can get it done for you. Absolutely, absolutely. This is... Uh, one of the deep, I mean, they're all young, but it's one of the deeper linebacker groups um, that, that we're going to be seeing, at least for us in, the last, in these last uh, four years. This will, be, this will be a good one. Okay. In the BYU secondary uh, currently, uh, no Chris Wilcox, at least, at least that we've seen yet. And Troy Warner, I think, is maybe in the same boat. Maybe you can talk about them a little bit. But you've got experience and you've got versatility. Diane Gomwoloku, uh, you've got a guy with a lot of snaps who's uh, in Austin Lee. And I think if you had to go for maybe a training camp MVP, uh, maybe one of those guys is right there in that mix, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Austin, we knew, was going to be a leader coming in. And uh, throughout, training cramp, throughout training camp, he's just done a phenomenal job and is, and is uh, one of the guys that we think is definitely a candidate for the, for the fall camp MVP as far as a leader and just being, being moved around. And, and uh, we'll continue to look at things as far as just using those guys and putting them in the right spot. But Austin Lee's done, done a great job. Any word on, uh, on Warner Wilcox, what uh, we might see from them, if anything, uh, this year? Uh, you know, we want to we wanna be uh, smart with bringing them back. Um, a lot, lot of times that really just kind of depends on how confident they are. And so um, may, maybe physically we, we're at the point right now where we could push them, but just would prefer for that to be their idea. Um, and it's just they know, they know their bodies and they know kind of where they've been and what they can do. Um, and so right now they're... The, the projected probably just to kind of wait a little bit, and we'll see, you know, a couple games in to see where they're at. But right now, there's uh, not really a plan to, to force those guys to play. Okay, time for a quick timeout. And this note that BYU TV's countdown to kickoff will air this Thursday at 8 p.m. Eastern Time, 5 p.m. Pacific. It's an expanded two-hour-plus edition of the show, leading to BYU and Utah from Lavelle Edwards Stadium. When we come back, some more on that game and your questions for defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki. As the coordinator's corner continues live from Studio C, stay with us. Kirby. My mission? Get into Old School Cafe. 
Or give you a call. Meet the founder, Teresa Goins. <laughs> Work alongside the staff and see how a restaurant runs. You're welcome. See why they do it and see, figure out how I can help. I don't know which one those are. And five, hope they don't realize that I'm not the best cook. All right, those even sound like <laughs> We both have an overwhelming desire to come in first all the time, no matter what. I think we're the best team because of our desire to make the experience great for everyone. Everything in my life since adoption has been about never being able to be told that you weren't good enough. Are you guys competitive? Not really. JD's very competitive. He doesn't like to admit that. I think there's a misunderstanding there. <laughs> Because if I let myself down and I'm going right back to that place where somebody said, nah, not good enough. So losing for me is like not an option because we're competitive by nature, but internally, I don't even see it on the board. Plus, we've known each other a really long time, so I think we've got a little see bit of See who the edge. competitive one is, can you see? <laughs> like, she's about the winning. I just want to develop relationships. He's my best friend, my bodyguard. He's just all around awesome. Pay me later. Garbers in the right flat, open, is Clark, makes the catch and is hit, ball comes loose, picked up, it's a scoop, and a score! Diane Gunwalaku on the fumble recovery, and the Cougars get back in the game just like that! You are in the coordinator's corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. We're continuing our conversation with defensive coordinator Elisa Tuiaki, now at full blast on the mic. Good to have you back, Coach E, with us. And uh, uh, we hit. let's hit D-line a little bit. We, we talked a bit about the secondary right before the break, middle linebacker before the break. Um, how deep do you think you can uh, can you be at the tackle and, and end spots, and how'd that uh, spot come together during camp? We, we moved a lot of guys around just as far as kind of testing guys out um, with, with different people, but uh, feel, feel really good just about the depth. I think we are pretty deep at the D-tackle spot. Um, a couple of you know, a couple of guys that are really starting to come into form. You know, JJ Nwig, we ended up playing at D end, uh, moving him from the offensive side. Now he's playing D tackle, and he just uh, he, he looks comfortable there. He's, he's a just, player there. He's a player there. So we're gonna you're gonna end up seeing him a little bit, and some right. of the young guys that you know we have a return missionary, <coughs> uh, Saleti Fevaleaki that came back is um, for a lot farther ahead than, than, than what we would have expected out of a return missionary, but mm -hmm. he's a guy that could be in the mix and, you know, we're not making any decisions as far as Richard and any of these guys yet, but he's a guy that, uh, made, made an impression on us in fall camp and just all the other guys that come back. I mean, we've got a lot of depth, um, and, and guys that are showing out where, where we didn't expect. Among the guys you've got back, uh, Zach Daw, Kairos Tonga, of course, Bracken El Bakri, uh, Lorenzo Fawatea, Trajan Peely, Devin Kofusi, Uriah Leatawa, there's some people there. There's, we got a lot of guys, <laughs> and it's a lot of good combinations because some of these guys can play end and tackle, and so um, we'll we'll move them around, shift them shift them around, and and uh, try to get the right combination as far as the the situations that we need to be in. But we've uh, we've got a lot of guys that we feel confident can play. We came out of the break with uh, a shot of last year's a scoop and score from Diane Gomwoliku in the in the Cal game. And uh, that's something you would definitely take on Thursday night. Uh, something Utah's done well against BYU are defensive scores in these games. And uh, last year, the pick six was kind of a game changer to get them back in the game, wasn't it? It was. It was. It kind of changed the mood. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's one of the things that we've been focusing on, obviously, is just kind of tightening everything up. But, but uh, the game wasn't over then. I, you know, I think BYU scored on its next possession. We did, and it ended up being 27-7. Yeah. And, and, uh, um, I think we've just got to be better as far as coaches and the way that our demeanor is when something like that happens. Because you know, bad things happen, and we just got to bounce back and just stay even keel and just keep playing. But um, you know, I think our kids have done a good job this camp and coming down from Kalani and what he's been preaching about uh, just the way that we've been framing things and seeing things and just having a good attitude and just playing hard. What were maybe some of the lessons learned uh, overall in that tough loss to Utah last season that you still take with you? Shoot, we've had a lot of opportunity to hear from the players as far as just uh, what they've learned from it. A lot of them talk about finishing. A lot of them talk about um, next guy up, being ready to play. And uh, you know, for me personally, there's uh, you know not not to uh, take any value away from what the game was, but I I, I I couldn't sleep for a couple of days. Had a hard time just kind of uh, reevaluating myself and um, you know what what I could have done differently, what I should have done. You know, looking back and kind of kicking myself just for some of the decisions that I made. But then at the end of it, 
especially just being around my family and kids. It was just they don't they don't know, you know. And sometimes it's a good reminder to get from your family that it really is just a game. And obviously we want to win and we want to go, but uh, um, that that was the one thing for me was you know it's. It's it's just a game, <laughs> and we're we're gonna we're gonna be okay at the end of it. And I think with the the attitude and the way that fall camp's been going, and just the the, the direction that we we've all been pushing with Coach Kalani at the helm, um, the boys are are super ready for this game. I think we are, and we're coming in we're coming in to win this game, and um, feel confident about it as well. For the most part, both teams are healthy at this time of year as you expect them to be with, you know, Camp Knox notwithstanding. Last year when you guys played, it was kind of a war of attrition for both sides. Uh, both, sides both sides came down a little shorthanded, and then BYU got shorthanded even more so in the game. And those injuries did end up, uh, you know, having, a, having a, a role by the end of it all, didn't they? Yeah, yeah, they did. And we had, we had a couple of guys playing that we wish we could have, uh, you know, it, it, wish wish they would have had a little bit more experience. But the bottom line is, you know, like some of the players have been talking about through camp. Be ready, next man up. Be ready. <laughs> next guy's got to be ready. Be ready to to contribute in the way that you can. Um, but we're we're super excited, and I think right now, with just where the the boys are, it's um, it doesn't really matter who's playing on that side or not. They're, if they're in the wrong jersey, our boys are going <laughs> to get after it, and that's that's kind of the attitude right now. On that attrition note, you saw the Utes last year without Huntley and Moss. Uh, this year they're back. What does Utah gain when they get a Tyler Huntley and a Zach Moss in that backfield? The quarter, quarterbacks are similar. I think I think Tyler Huntley coming back is a little bit, um, probably a little bit more uh, seasoned, a little, little bit better as a passer. But they're the same guy essentially as far as the way that we see it defensively. Um, guys that can hurt you in the run game and guys that can that can scramble. And we've got to make sure that we keep them in check regardless of which quarterback's in. But the running back is a good player. I think he's a He's a tough runner. He's a he's a guy that gets downhill, that um, does a really good job just just running. So we've got to corral him. We've got to gang tackle him, and we've got to we've got to you know have a lot of guys around him as far as stripping the ball and just first guy in, second guy in, third guy in. And he's got to feel that uh, you know by his fourth, fifth, sixth carry, it's not just one guy making a tackle, but he's always kind of taking a shot that maybe he didn't see. And and that's the plan for us is just kind of just wear him down by just getting after him. Uh, Andy Ludwig is back as the Utes OC. Uh, you were, you spent a short time in the same staff room with him when you were up at Utah. I think you guys had a year, maybe a year, maybe of crossover together. Uh, you studied his teams a lot, certainly. Uh, you know his style, tendencies. Uh, what do you think his attack will look like here in, in 2009, and how will they differ primarily from what you saw last time you played him? He's he's a really good coordinator, a really good coach, a good person as well. And you know he's uh, he's a guy that. Uh, um, that has always believed in execution being his strategy, and I, I really like that about him. I really like that about the team that he's been on. It's not about uh, trying to scheme up the best X's and O's, and and just making sure that his kids play kids kids play fast as well as um, execute. And so the the from all the film that we've watched, I mean, they do a really good job. I thought that they had pretty good backs at Vanderbilt that uh, that were good, and I think the back that they have now uh, up there at Utah, similar to the ones that he had at Vanderbilt, and he just. He, he, he put the trust in them and just ran the ball consistently, took shots, and just uh, was conservative. I think if you were to uh, put a tag on, on uh, Coach Ludd, he would, be, he would be one of those conservative guys. But, um, you know, I think he, just a lot of experience is what he brings to the table and, and a good coach. And so You got him as the last game of the regular season last year. You get him as the first game of the regular season this year. Uh, whether it's a preference or not, what's your what's your uh, general sense of getting them right out of the shoots here? Really excited, really excited, because um, you know the way that it ended last year, <clears throat> that game couldn't come fast enough for us and and everybody on our team um, in the locker room. We're, we're all excited. They're the first ones up. Um, we want that shot. We want we want them to be the first one. We're excited that they are. Okay, social media now for Coach uh, Eli Satuiaki, hashtag CCBYU. Uh, from Spencer, uh, what will the defense do to improve their havoc rate and uh, pressure the quarterback more, if you can? Um, well, <laughs> we, we, we've talked a lot about this just kind of through the years as far as the way that you prefer to be aggressive. Um, you know, we, what, what we've kind of morphed into and what we've, we've decided to to uh, as far as playing to the strengths of our kids and our team is really um, putting the pressure on our D-line and saying we want to be the best D-line in the country and we're going to get sacks in a three-man rush. That's, Not having to bring people. That's how aggressive we want to be. If you want to be aggressive, that's super aggressive. It's just, just sitting back there in coverage and trying to rush with three. Um, I think there are times to bring pressure, and we will when, when the time is right. 
Um, against a quarterback like this, I don't know how much you want to bring. Uh, that, that's, that's still kind of a question that we talk about and, and game plan, and I'll sit up late at night kind of thinking to myself what the situations are as far as when to bring it and how smart it would be. I think if this guy's got to beat us with his arm and we keep him in check um, without giving up something, you know, a big play with him just taking off and everybody else playing man-to-man -man running, away from him, that's where big plays happen is when you're, when you're pressuring a lot and you got everybody turned and playing man-to-man -man coverage. I don't think this is the game for that. I think this, this game is to keep this kid in check, mm -hmm. make him beat us with his arm, and uh, really challenge our, our D-line. Uh, challenge our D-line. We've talked about that in practice, just about them relishing a three-man rush mm -hmm. and uh, seeing how many sacks we can get in a three-man rush. And the boys, are, the boys are up to the challenge. They've been really excited, and that's kind of been their thing right now is taking pride. And when I give them the three-man rush signal or whatever it is, they, you know, it's a little bit of excitement and mm -hmm. seeing how, how much pressure we can get with three. Big part of that is Kairos Tonga. How's he looking these days? Looking really good. Um, he's a, I think he's a mismatch. Uh, no matter where you put him, whether he's at the nose or tackle or, or wherever he is, and, and we're going to be excited to see that match up. And I know our, our offensive line that have been matched up with him will be excited to see him go against somebody else because they know the strengths and the, just the power and explosiveness that he, that he brings. And it's going to be, it's gonna be a, a, a mismatch, I believe, no matter, no matter who's covering him. Okay. Uh, from social media, uh, Cade Christlieb on Twitter uh, asks Coach Tuiaki, what part of the game film uh, from last year's matchup against Utah have you watched more of? First half, second half, or do you go right to the fourth quarter? It's, it's all of it. It's all of it. But, uh, you know, a, a lot of it is really just kind of um, self-scout just because it's a different coordinator. Um, but, you know, everything always comes down to, um, you know, assign blown assignments or technical issues as far as just you know the, the the athlete performing and so we look at it all and we've 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 watched the film five million times by now and and it's uh you know and we look at it with a different purpose okay let's look at it and let's kind of evaluate ourselves in this coverage let's look at it and let's evaluate ourselves as far as the way that we're teaching this technique and so um right when we go back and look at it it's not anything that's probably emotionally driven as far as hey let's go back to the fort so we can get pumped up but it's not really like it's kind of okay we we knew what the issues were maybe let's see if we can kind of nitpick and tear this apart let's go back and look at this let's go back and look at this and at the end of it uh, most of what we look at is Vanderbilt stuff um, but we do come back we that's have, where Ludwig was last right yep, yeah yep, that's where Ludwig was and and that's uh, we do go back and still watch it just to just to kind of uh, evaluate ourselves and the way that we're teaching and, and whether the kids are understanding what we're doing Okay, a quick double back as we wrap up with you. Uh, Coach Lamb gave us his special teams MVP in uh, Jake Oldroyd for camp. And we talked a bit about him earlier, too. Just want to restate that you like the way Austin Lee played uh, defensively for you during this training camp. And if you had to go with a guy, you'd probably, probably go there. Yeah, I think there's a lot of candidates on defense, a lot of guys that have stepped up. But Austin Lee has been, he, he's been that, uh, that, that, that guy. He's been consistent. Uh, we've moved him around different, different spots and tried him out different places. And he's just, uh, he's, he's been really good for us. Former Ute. That's right. He was one back in the day. That's right. For a time. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right, E, great to have you with us, and we'll do it again soon, and uh, good luck on Thursday night. Appreciate it. Thanks. All right, coming up, our third of three coordinators will join us as OC Jeff Grimes steps into Studio C. That's straight ahead as the Coordinator's Corner continues right here on BYU TV. I'm Dave McCann. Tomorrow on After Further Review, we look at five key Cougars who will be counted on to beat Utah. It's the best hour of BYU football on television. Blaine Fowler, David Nixon, and Brian Logan explain the game. Tomorrow night, 7 Eastern, 4 Pacific on the BYU TV app. Also Wednesday morning at 11 Eastern, 8 Pacific. And Saturday morning at 9 Eastern, 6 Pacific on BYU TV. I can't remember the last time I've had lobster. Or do I just sort of nibble at it like this? Are you ready for an adventure? I've set aside seven days with no interruptions, just to hang out one-on-one. -on -one. We're going to have a vacation, a bonding vacation. And we are going to confront some of our fears. I don't like it. OK, I've had enough. I've had enough. I'm calling the shots, so you better be ready. <laughs> Do you know how scary that is to me? Yep. 
He's pinching me. He's pinching me. Uh, has anyone ever been thrown out of the boat? Only troublemakers. Why are we doing this, John? This is fun. Oh, oh my. Is it okay if I cry a bit? Oh, 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 that's what I'm talking about. Oh, 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 oh. Monica, step back. He's going to love this, man. I'm petrified. We usually watch Jeopardy. That's about it. She's about to do this. I'm proud of her. What you need to do is channel excitement, exuberance, and love of adventure. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Are you sure you want to do it? No. Jump! 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 Zach and the gun, Burt to his left. Zach goes deep down the far sideline. He's got a man, and it is caught by Olivia Hippo. 25, 20, 15, 10, he's going in. Touchdown, Olivia Hippo. And the Cougars break it wide open. All right, the BYU Cougars this week kicking off the 2019 college football season against Utah. This uh, first time ever that these two teams meet to open the season, and as such, it's the first time they've faced off in the month of August, naturally. Beginning his second season as BYU's offensive coordinator is uh, Jeff Grimes. Coach Grimes, welcome back in. Glad to be here. It didn't seem like too long ago we were here uh, doing this thing, and here we are again. I find that the older I get, the shorter the off-seasons get. It's funny there, how that works. There's no question. The years yeah. are speeding up. How do you look back on, uh, on year one as the Cougs play caller? Um, I had a lot of fun. I think I learned a lot, um, in particular, about our team. Um, and I think we... We took a positive step in the right direction, but but also I look back at it with, um, I don't want to say regret because you kind of move on from one season to the next, but I certainly feel like we could have done much better and excited to, to prove something more this season. We see in the graphic that our TV audience can observe uh, so some improvements, some notable improvements. And uh, since points are always the name of the game, a double digit increase is, is a pretty notable thing. Yeah, I think so. Um, you know, the the, the red zone um, touchdown efficiency was something that um, that we were really happy about. Um, turnovers, we, we went from 27 giveaways the previous year to only 16 last year, so I thought that was a real positive. Um, a couple of areas we're really looking at this year to improve, as I've mentioned to you already, and we've talked about a little bit, is um, just having more explosive plays and being better on third down. And I think we've addressed that in camp and are certainly headed in the right direction. Our, um, our third down co conversion rate in camp thus far for all the, all the time we've been going against our defense is at 52%, which is much higher than, than it was at any time last year. Now that's just practice. And obviously sometimes there are things that happen in practice that, that are not quite the same as in games. I recognize that, but I think we have uh, made an improvement there as well as um, our explosive play ratio last year. Um, we were one of the lower teams in the country in terms of having big plays. So we've made that an issue, uh, an important issue to address this camp as well. And, and we've been much better in our, um, in our number of explosive plays as well as, as third down. So I think we're at least attempting to address the things that were, that were um, our largest deficits last year. How much is explosive play potential directly tied to the natural abilities Zach Wilson possesses? Yeah, I think it, I think it all starts with the quarterback. Um, even, you know, a guy like Zach, um, who can run it and throw it well, obviously possesses the ability for big plays in the passing game or with his legs, scramble for a first down, or to extend a play and then make a throw. Um, but, but any quarterback, really, um, if he's skilled, then he makes everyone else around him better. Even if he's not a great runner, his ability to throw the football down the field increases um, your efficiency in the run game. And so I think all, all those things will, will, um, will help us have some bigger plays this year. For 2018, Zach's season ends on a real high note, goes 18 for 18 in the bowl game. Then there's some uncertainty because he undergoes surgery almost immediately. Regarding him, how concerned were you about the prospects back in, say, January, and how confident are you now that you've gone through in August with him? I think any time you, you uh, mess with a quarterback's shoulder, there's cause for concern. Um, but I know Zach's work ethic, and I know how much the game means to him, and so I felt very confident that we had enough time and we had him with the right doctors and, and with our training staff, medical staff, everybody get him back right, but you never know till you see him throw it, so um, I certainly feel much better about it now than I did um, in July, but he's, he's done a great job, had a great camp, so 
um, I'm excited about it. Yeah. It's baseball vernacular, but we use the phrase pitch count relative to a guy rehabbing and, and how you want him to look for game one. To that extent, in terms of the protocol you had him on, did it kind of go as planned, as expected? Yeah, yeah, it did. We started him out fairly light, and we did keep a pitch count every day, and, and uh, A-Rod and Steve Pincock did a good job every day of managing that, and, and we gradually gave him more throws as, as camp went on, but um, at this point, we're beyond the number of throws he can have in any one game, I think, unless we snap it 100 times and he throws it 100 times. <laughs> so I think he'll, he'll be just fine. I know he will be. If we had to use a very non-empirical uh, word like zip, how, how does he look throwing-wise at right now? Good, good. I think he, he can make all the throws just like he could before. And I think the thing that, um, that, that we'll see as a largest, that everyone will see is the largest difference in his game now is his quickness and decision making mm. and so you've talked a lot about that in camp yeah, it's so his right? yeah his ability to recognize defenses and get the ball out where he wants it to go in a quick amount of time is has um, has been significantly better this camp than at any time in the past so um, yeah we, we feel really good about where he's at not that you want to see him take a hit at any point, but he's going to get hit. And I guess for that's the next hurdle maybe to see, or the next box to check is how does he withstand the physical aspect of the game since he's been kind of off limits here. Yeah, but that's usually the case with quarterbacks. You know, very often you don't hit quarterbacks in fall camp. And, and the fact that he's come back from a shoulder injury, I've been more concerned with him throwing than just, than just taking a hit. I mean, everybody who, who has any type of surgery, um, I guess, has to take that first hit. Mm. But I'm sure he'll be fine. I'm not worried about that. Naturally, a lot of optimism because of how many weapons are, are around Zach right now. We talked about Zach a bit, and the last two seasons, BYU's top, pet, uh, top pass catcher has been Matt Bushman. He, too, had a little work in the offseason, but he, too, looks great as well and looks to pick up where he left off. And, and if you had to go with uh, maybe an MVP on the offensive side of the ball in camp, that's maybe a guy you look to? Yeah, definitely. And, and I thought about that last week and, and uh, tried to think about who I would say had the best camp out of anyone, and I think it would be Matt particularly given the fact that he's coming back off the surgery, didn't miss a practice, um, has continued to improve as a blocker, has improved as a route runner, and still has the ball skills where if you put it anywhere um, that, his, that his ears can even hear it, he's going to come down <laughs> with the ball. So, yeah, re really pleased with Matt. Uh, what, uh, what makes him special when you say ball skills? Like, is this just a thing that certain guys just know how to bring every ball in their radius in? I mean, well, I think he's got natural catching radius because of his height and his length and his ability to jump. Um, but then some guys just have sticky fingers and, don't, and some don't. Uh, <laughs> some guys can judge where a ball is going to end up and some guys can't. I guess just like, a, just like a guy that's a punt returner. Some guys can find that ball in the air and judge exactly where it's going to land and others can't. And he has the ability to locate the ball in the air in a short amount of time and, and rotate his body how he needs to 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 get his hands on it and just seems to always come down with it. And BYU's had a uh, big number tight ends over years and years and years. It's not unusual that a really good tight end be the team's leading receiver, and Matt's been that the last couple of years. Yeah, for sure. The years when I was here and we were, we were really good, we always had good tight ends, yeah. and, and I think Matt certainly fits that. At receiver and at running back, you've got a burger chain. You've got five guys. Uh, in the backfield, you've got, you got Williams, Katoa, Asupa, Algier, and Finau to go with your top five, let's say. And then out wide, you've got Tahifo, Romney, Shumway, Milne, and Simon, with maybe Keanu Hill uh, trying to nudge in as a six. So if those two quintets perform the way you expect them to, it's going to be a pretty good offense this year. I think so. And certainly there's a lot more room at receiver than there is at running back. Yeah. Uh, we, we have the ability to play two running backs at the same time, and we have certain sets that will allow us to do that. Um, but at receiver, you know, you're going to be playing with two or three of those guys most of the time, potentially even four at once. And so, so those guys will get plenty of opportunities. But as I've said before, I really felt like our receivers had a great spring. And I think they've continued to grow um, this summer and this fall camp. And, and I'm looking for significantly improved play. And I thought they played pretty well last year, but I think they're going to be even better this year and, and not just be um, maybe not just dependable, but take that next step and, and make, make more big plays. Okay. Right before the break, uh, we mentioned Matt at tight end, but there are others there. Uh, who should we look to besides Matt Bushman to give you help there at the tight spot? So, you know, we've got a couple of newcomers um, in, um, and then a couple of guys who are coming back. You know, Morona is coming back off of injury, mm -hmm. um, and, and he's continued to progress and has, has had a good couple of days of practice here recently. Um, Joe Tukawafu has rejoined the team. And um, 
and, and has continued to improve and get himself kind of back in shape and knock the rust off. And then we've got some new guys um, in Carter Wheat, Mason Wake, Kyle Griffiths is a guy that always gives us great effort. And so we've got enough numbers there to do what we need to in terms of personnel groupings. Sounds good. Break time on the coordinator's corner. When we come back, we will remind you that uh, for your day-to-day -day Cougar sports play-by-play, -play, you'll watch BYU Sports Nation with Spencer Linton and Jerem Jordan. And that's weekdays at noon Eastern on BYU TV and BYU Radio. Coming up after this, Coach Jeff Grimes previews the Utah game. We get your questions as well from Twitter. You're in the coordinator's corner brought to you by JCW's. We're live in Studio C. JCW's, the Burger Boys. Before I was a coach at BYU or before I was even a player, I was a BYU fan. That's why BYU football exists, is because of the fans. To have a bunch of fans that want to see you be aggressive, I think everybody can live through our 123 guys on the roster and the 11 that are on the field at a time. Really, it all starts and ends with the fans. I think the thing that makes us the best team is I'm kind of the calm to her crazy. I think we have a pretty good strategy in that we're careful planners. Paul likes to say we, we measure twice and cut once. I'm super type A. I'm super organized. I'm going to have a plan, but he can help me execute it. I think my sense of balance will play a, a big part in it and just her drive and competitiveness, actually. We're definitely going to have conflicts because I do not love his driving. <laughs> we're going to be in a car for <laughs> a lot of days. Are you guys going to win? Yes. Yes. Yeah. We wouldn't be on here if we weren't going to win. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> just, yeah. I think the resolution is for me to just close my eyes and not watch him driving, and we'll just get past it. There are just definitely some times that you need to communicate, and there's sometimes you have quiet time. <laughs> Brought to you in part by JCW's The Burger Boys. Bailey's Moving and Storage. More than just a move. Siegfried and Jensen. Serving Utah families for over 25 years. Ten years since BYU's last win in the series. The Cougars host Utah on Thursday night. Uh, the teams have met eight times over the last nine years. All but one of the meetings have been decided by eight points or fewer courtesy of at Cougar Stats on Twitter, of national series contested over the last 25 seasons. The most closely contested series relative to average margin of victory is BYU versus Utah. And uh, Coach uh, Jeff Grimes last year, yet another example of one of these kinds of BYU-Utah games that goes down to the very end. And the result wasn't what you wanted, but it is testament to how these two teams tend to play each other every year. No question. Um, it's always going to be a tight game and a well-fought game. Um, we just like for it to be a little bit well, better played game from our perspective. And, you know, it was like several games last year that we that we showed what we can do, but probably not as much as we're capable of in terms of the finish. What was most instructive to you uh, relative to this year's game, what we saw last year up on the hill? Well, certainly I've been spending a lot of time watching it this week. And, and honestly, the the biggest thing that I notice as I'm watching the film is the improvement in our players. I mean, I look at Zach and and how much more knowledgeable and how much better he is. I mean, last year he was a talented kid out there who was just trying to make plays, and now he's he's um, he's uh, a really good college quarterback. And our offensive line is better. We're we're better at running back. We're better we're better um, pretty much everywhere on offense because we've got a lot of the same guys back, or we've upgraded. And so um, as I watch that film um, and, and clips from that film and certain cut-ups, I just continue to see how I think we wouldn't make that same mistake this year or we would do something just a little bit better. Now, the flip side of that is they have a lot of experience back on defense, and I'm, I'm certain that they're saying the same thing. So it'll be another uh, opportunity to, to show who, who's got the best Thursday night. 
Coach Sataki talks a lot about Lavelle Edwards and his stadium and what it means to him and what he hopes it means to the players. When you were here first time around, 2004 through six, your last season here, you guys went 6-0 and at home. Um, it'd be great to kind of recreate that, uh, that, that home field magic again. The, the schedule's there to do it this year, certainly, right? Yeah, and I, and I think we do need to do that, and, and we've taken steps to, uh, to approach that, and I think um, Kalani certainly addressed it, and I think our players are ready to, to defend our home field as well. Question from, uh, go to Jeff. This is a lighthearted question from social media on Twitter. Uh, for those out there thinking of possibly testing the waters of mustache growing, What's the man day way, man day lesson way to get proper growth and development? This is a good one, by the way, you've got going. <laughs> they, well, what I did this year, which was different than last year, <laughs> is um, I allowed all my facial hair to grow for a certain period of time and uh, probably a little bit longer than last year and then just shaved off what I had accumulated here. And, and my wife said, you're not starting with that thing, are you? And I said, yeah, I actually am. So I would say grow out the entire beard as long as you can stand it and then shave off the rest and then you'll find yourself with a, with a very handsome mustache. And sideburns, we should note. Well, you know, my dad wore sideburns every day of his life, as long as I ever knew him. And I figure if they were good enough for him, they were good enough for me. The thing with him is he found them in the 60s and 70s and just kind of <laughs> stuck with them. And um, I don't know, I just decided I would, I would take it another step this year. And my wife hates those as well, but <laughs> I haven't seen her much recently, so I guess that's okay. It's a good look. She'll come around. She's bound to come around. She'll come around if we win enough games. Well, let's hope it starts Thursday, right? That's right. It's good to have you back in. Uh, again, I, I always uh, gain a great deal from these conversations, and I look forward to another season with you. Excited. Can't wait. All right. Thanks a lot, Jeff. That'll be a wrap for our season debut of the Coordinator's Corner. You can watch us Mondays at 1 p.m. Eastern, 10 a.m. Pacific, right here on BYU TV from our new home here in Studio C. For coaches Grimes, Tuiaki, and Lamb, my name is Greg Rubel. A saying in the meantime and in between time, Go Cougs, and we'll see you next week on the Coordinator's Corner, brought to you by JCW's The Burger Boys. They want my help. They'll have to let me decide which reno they really need, and it may not be the one they want. How does that look? I don't think I've ever seen plywood this rotten. This you? was not in the plan. Oh, it's in my plan. I'm speechless. <laughs>